Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon, good morning and good evening. Um, I'd like to welcome you all here today to this CPA webinar, uh, the first of its kind for the organisation. Um, this webinar, as you are aware, is on delivering parliamentary democracy uh, during um, the COVID-19 pandemic, a virtual briefing for Commonwealth clerks and parliamentary staff. My name is Jack Hardcastle. Um, I'm a programmes assistant at the CPA and I will be facilitating this session uh, with you all today. I'm delighted to say that we're, we're joined by over 100 attendees um, from across the Commonwealth um, and beyond. Um, so thank you um, first and foremost for, for joining us today. I don't need to begin this session by going into any sort of detail um, about the impacts of the pandemic. Uh, it's social, public health and political. I'm sure we're all well versed on that by this stage. Um, Importantly as well, its impact on um, political institutions and importantly for us today, the effective functioning of Parliament. So to this end, I'm delighted to say uh, for this panel discussion and for this virtual session today, I'm joined um, by a brilliant panel of clerks and parliamentary staff uh, from across the Commonwealth and beyond. Uh, we have representatives here from the UK House of Commons, the House of Commons in Canada, uh, the Chamber of Deputies in Brazil, and the Tinvold, the Parliament of the Isle of Man. So we have a very broad range of voices here today and I'm sure we're going to get some really good insights and food for thought uh, moving forward in our respective uh, legislatures and jurisdictions. So before I hand over to our first speaker uh, I'll just briefly go over a few housekeeping notes uh, for the session. Um, you should have all consented to this when you joined the session but just to remind you that this session is being recorded. Um, just to clarify um, to all the attendees here, um, as attendees, you will not have the ability to unmute yourselves or turn your mic on only when instructed to during the Q&A session. Um, following the presentations from our panelists, we will have a Q&A session. Uh, attendees will be invited to pose their questions to panelists. Um, at this point, we ask um, for the sake of, of strict timekeeping, um, that you keep your answer, you, you keep your questions very short and sweet. Um, if you would like to make comments or share experiences, uh, please use the chat function uh, to share with uh, attendees as much as possible. Um, I will, before we begin, um, you will now see on your screen uh, very shortly a short poll, which is a pre-assessment um, evaluation for the CPA purposes. This really is designed to help us um, monitor and make sure that we're delivering, you know, in the future, the best um, webinars we can. So I would appreciate very much, if you don't mind, just spending a few seconds to fill this out uh, before we begin. That would be much appreciated. So I'll just give you a few more seconds for those last remaining ones to, to fill it out if they would like to. Okay, that's a brilliant response. Thank you very much for that. Um, so I'm going to stop talking for now. Um, and I'm delighted to pass um, you all over to our first speaker of the day for some opening remarks, uh, the Acting Secretary General of the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association, uh, Mr Jarvis Matia. Thank you, Jarvis. Thank you, Jack. Uh, <clears throat> good morning, good afternoon, good evening, all. It's a great pleasure to welcome you all to this uh, uh, briefing. Uh, probably I have the easiest job uh, amongst the panelists uh, because my job is simply to welcome you all and to hope that uh, you will um, benefit from the discussions, but you also share your experiences in terms of how you are handling the situation that is facing the world today. Before I do go further, I just wanted to bring greetings from the chairperson of the CPA, um, Honorable uh, Emilia Lifaka. She had wanted to participate in this call, but because of uh, other commitments, she has not been able to join the call, but she asked me to convey her greetings and her 
uh, warm wishes to you all uh, as you uh, deliver it this afternoon. I also want to welcome you all to this and uh, also to note that uh, four regions are represented in this discussion, Africa, uh, Caribbean and, and Americas, um, Canada and the British Islands and the Mediterranean. So this actually shows to us that perhaps uh, uh, this is a very worthwhile uh, event that we need to come together to uh, share our experiences and ideas. I also wanted to um, apologize for um, not having you know, uh, enough uh, women on the panel. Uh, you know that the CPA is a gender um, um, focused organization. It believes in gender equality and gender parity, but it was not possible for us to um, uh, get enough uh, uh, women at short notice to come and uh, be part of the panelists uh, today. But we are delighted that uh, we have uh, amongst the, uh, us Patricia, who will be able to share uh, her perspective and also uh, the uh, initiatives that the Brazil um, uh, Parliament has done in terms of adjusting and putting in place measures to ensure that the business of Parliament continues. I also want to thank uh, the panelists, Eric, uh, um, Liam, Jonathan, uh, and of course, I've mentioned Patricia uh, already for making time to be able to share the experience and expertise and also to uh, learn from, from each other uh, in this forum. Uh, lastly, I want to thank my colleagues who have been able to arrange this, uh, Jack, uh, Matthew, uh, Clive, and others who have been working in the background to uh, prepare for this. We in the CPA Secretariat are, are very delighted to have uh, this series of conversations with uh, our members to see how we can be helpful, but how we can also share you know, ideas because this pandemic is uh, perhaps the first of its kind in the modern times. And obviously the uh, disruption that has resulted is very damaging. We need to mitigate and see uh, how we can all come together to share ideas on how we can ensure that the business of, of parliament continues. Um, we, our recent publication on the uh, toolkit uh, for parliamentarians in terms of dealing with COVID is one of the resources that uh, we encourage you to, uh, to refer to. I think in the course of the discussions this afternoon, that toolkit will be shared on the chat. So look out for that if you don't have it already handy, I think it's uh, useful to have uh, uh, recourse to it and um, to be able to use it in our day-to-day. -day. So without, um, uh, without wasting more time, I just wanted to reiterate our thanks and appreciation and we look forward to your insights, uh, sharing your, your, your experiences, uh, expertise and ideas as to how we can work together as uh, the Commonwealth, uh, an institution that represents, you know, parliaments across the Commonwealth in looking at how we can adjust and learn from each other in terms of ensuring that uh, the business of parliament continues, not only in this pandemic, but in any crisis, in any crisis that would come um, in the future. The role of uh, IT and uh, information technology um, facilities I think it's something that, um, you know, for some of us, it's a new um, uh, phenomenon, but for some of us, maybe there are some lessons that uh, can help others who are grappling with uh, working remotely and also seeing how the business of parliament as, as, as traditionally has been, can be adjusted to ensure that uh, the, 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 uh, it doesn't get affected. So with those re few remarks, once again, thanks to you all for making time to participate in this um, uh, um, event and I look forward to interacting with you during and after the after the uh, the event this afternoon. Jack. Thank you very much Jarvis for those opening remarks. Um, now I'm not going to keep talking so I will pass over as quickly as possible to our first panelist today uh, who is Liam Lawrence Smith. Um, Liam is the clerk of uh, legislation in the UK House of Commons um, and he's going to share some experiences in terms of sitting uh, virtual plenary sessions in the UK House of Commons. The UK Parliament, as we know, have been very fast acting and proactive in response to the pandemic and have uh, enabled work in the House um, in terms of hybrid and virtual sittings. So without further ado, I'll pass over to you now, Liam, for some remarks. Thank you. 
Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to show you what the House of Commons and indeed the House of Lords have been like. So I've got a short uh, film to show you. I should say that one of the things I'm trying to show is what happens when things go wrong. So if it looks as if the, the recording has gone wrong, that's what I'm trying to show you, what happens when a recording go, or a, a virtual proceeding go, goes wrong. Um, I think the main story we've had is rapid change and a lot of collaboration between people right across the house and especially our IT people and their uh, contractors. This is mainly about the chamber, but our select committees have also been meeting uh, entirely virtually and they've been broadcast online with great success. So Matthew, if you want to play the recording, please. Order! Order. Yesterday, the House agreed to a motion to allow members to participate virtually in proceedings of the House for the first time in 700 years of history of the House of Commons. So I'd like to welcome everyone, both members joining us remotely from their constituencies up and down the UK and members here in the Chamber, to the first hybrid sitting of the House of Commons. I thank honourable members who are present in the Chamber for continuing to observe the guidance that has been issued about social distancing, not only in relation to each other but also in relation to the staff of the House who are in the Chamber and indeed myself. Before we begin, I want to place on record that the parliamentary privilege applies to all members participating on the same basis, regardless of whether they are contributing virtually or present in the chamber. Also, of course, the same rules and courtesies apply to members participating virtually, as far as practical, as they do the members participating physically. Members present in the chamber should not rise in their places to catch my eye, but wait to be called, although they should then rise to speak as well, if they are in the chamber. My Lords, virtual proceedings of the House of Lords will now begin. I'd like to remind members that these proceedings are subject to parliamentary privilege and what we say is available to the public, both in Hansard and to those listening uh, and now watching. We are resuming our live streaming uh, today, so we're very much back on air. I remind participating members that their microphones will be set to mute and that they should uh, immute their microphones shortly before we reach their place in the speakers list. And members are asked not to use the group chat function. My Lords, the virtual proceedings on oral questions will now commence. I will call each oral question in the normal way. I will then call on the minister to make the initial response. Then I will call on the Lord who asked the original question to ask their supplementary question. Then the Minister will again respond and I will then call in turn those Lords asking supplementary questions as listed on the speakers list. Please do ensure that questions and answers are, are short because if they're not it excludes other people and I apologise in advance if it's not possible for everyone to be called. I ask each speaker to ensure that their microphone is unmuted prior to asking the supplementary question. Uh, each speaker's microphone will be returned to mute uh, once their supplementary question has finished. In accordance uh, with the guidance agreed by the Procedure Committee, uh, I should remind uh, members, if they are not listed, it is not possible to ask a supplementary question nor take part in proceedings. I think it's fair to say that I'm surprised to be introducing a motion to introduce remote voting in the House of Commons. In general, I'm not an advocate of change to the House's voting system or to be perfectly honest to many other things. It's always, look, look, Lord Palmerston's words ring in my mind, change, change, aren't things bad enough already? Um, uh, and I am strongly of the view that our current approach is the best one. 
But as I said yesterday, parliamentary procedure is not an end in itself, but a means to allow the institution to function successfully. We are facing a particular set of circumstances that have required us to be innovative so that we can ensure that the House of Commons can both scrutinise the government and continue to legislate. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Today, I make my maiden speech in circumstances I could have never imagined. I always said I got into politics to serve the community that I love and have lived in all of my life. And I always said I'd somehow redefine what it meant to be a constituency MP. So along with making history as a first female MP for the area and the youngest Conservative MP in the country and the first Member of Parliament ever to make the maiden speech remotely from their own home. And I do this, Mr Deputy Speaker, because I wanted to stay here, rooted into my community, to rise to the challenges we face. Because as I've always said, we are stronger together. And it would be remiss of me not to mention my predecessor, Graham Jones, for his nine years of service. And to remind you that for the first time in 27 years, Hindburn returned a Conservative MP. Many congratulations, Sarah. Stella Creasy. Mr Deputy Speaker, I hope that you can hear me. Um, I'd like to start by congratulating the member from Heimborn for an extraordinary maiden speech. It's difficult to make these at the best of times. I hope I can tell her that I think her mum would have been extremely proud of her and join her in wishing her dad happy birthday. Can I also say that many of us on this side of the house are extremely grateful for what she said about her predecessor. Christian Wakeford. Um, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And may I start by paying tribute to my honourable friend, the member for Heimburn, on a truly moving maiden speech. Uh, she will go down in history as the first maiden speech to be performed. And having been a councillor with her father for the last seven years, I know that he would be immensely proud of her, if not a tad jealous. Madam Deputy Speaker, I, I welcome this bill as a step in the right direction. And I do hope that this bill is just that like a step towards fully tackling domestic abuse in our society. Madam Deputy Speaker, 2.4 million. Order, order, I hesitate to interrupt the Honourable Gentleman. The sound quality is very bad. The, those in the chamber are not really able to hear the Honourable Gentleman. And now he's disappeared completely. I'm afraid that we've lost the Honourable Member for Bury South for the time being, but we will try to retrieve him for later in the debate. So let us go now to Sarah Owen. We can now return to Christian Wakeford, but it will be audio only. Christian Wakeford. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Uh, and may I start by paying tribute to my honourable friend, the member for Heinburn, on a truly moving maiden speech. She will go down in history as the first maiden speech to be performed virtually. And having been a councillor with her father for the last seven years, I know that he would be immensely proud of her, if not a tad jealous. Mr Deputy Speaker, through the action this government has taken and with the support of the whole House, we will defeat this virus. We've heard speeches from Shetlands to Devon Central and many constituencies in between. And everyone is committed to ensuring that the government does everything it can to relieve the distress that our nation is now enduring. We will shepherd our country safely through this period of uncertainty and disruption. And the United Kingdom will emerge from this crisis stronger, more resilient and more united than before. And for all these reasons, Mr Deputy Speaker, I commend this bill to the House. Yeah, yeah. And I too would like to associate myself with the comments of the Shadow Minister in thanking all those who have made uh, today's proceedings work so smoothly. Thank you very much. The question is that the bill be now read a second time. 
As many as are of that opinion say aye. Aye. On the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Finance Bill Programme motion to be moved formally. I beg to move. The question is, as on the order paper, as many as are of that opinion say aye. Aye. On the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The House now stands adjourned. Order. Order. So um, th there we have clips from what our House of Commons looks like, which answers some of the questions I know that people wanted to ask, for example, about the place of the mace and so on. And I, I do hope you caught sight of the fact that it was myself sitting as clerk of the table for that final clip. We're we'll very happy to respond to questions later. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Liam, for that really informative uh, presentation and, and video especially. It's really interesting to see certainly these historic uh, sessions being played, many for the first time in these hybrid and, and virtual settings. So uh, thank you for, for that intervention, uh, uh, Liam. So next I'm going to move to Eric Jancy. Um, Eric is the clerk assistant at the uh, House of Commons in Canada and Again, Canada is another legislature that has been very proactive in its response to the pandemic, specifically uh, the special uh, committee created recently on response to the pandemic and some other uh, work with the committees uh, conducting, for example, virtual meetings and so forth. Uh, so I'll pass it over now to Eric, who will be able to provide some more insights into the work of himself, his colleagues and the um, House of Commons in Canada. Great, thank you very uh, much, uh, Jack, and thank you to the CPA for the invitation to participate in this webinar. It's great to see some international colleagues again. Uh, in recent weeks, the House of Commons in Canada has adopted a number of procedural and technological measures designed to ensure that it can continue to debate, pass legislation, and scrutinize government activity during the COVID pandemic. I will be speaking on our pandemic response with particular emphasis on our committees. While I won't have a video like Liam, I will have a little bit later in my presentation a few pictures to show you, but I thought maybe a short chronology of what's happened over the last few weeks might be useful. So on March 13th, our Board of Internal Economy met and decided three things. First, to close visitor access to the House of Commons precinct and to cancel public tours. Second, to suspend all committee travel. International travel by parliamentary associations had, be, had been suspended a few days earlier by the governing body known as the Joint Interparliamentary Council. And third, to cancel all parliamentary functions and events in the House of Commons precinct. That same day, the House modified its sitting calendar by unanimous consent to stand adjourned until April 20th, with the possibility of an extension if required in the public interest, or the possibility of a recall to address the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. On March 16th, House administration employees were advised to work from home unless otherwise instructed by their manager. On March 24th, the House of Commons was recalled to debate and adopt legislation relating to support for certain individuals and businesses impacted by COVID-19. This was our first emergency recall of the House since 1992 and saw only a limited number of members, members participate for health and safety reasons. It was the parties that determined how many MPs per party would attend. During that sitting, the House also adopted a motion authorizing the Standing Committee on Health and the Standing Committee on Finance to hold meetings by either video conference or teleconference during the adjournment period. However, it's important to note that for the most part, they were only authorized to meet to hear evidence from witnesses. While we have been using video conference technology for years for committee witnesses, we have never done so for the members and staff of the committee. Accordingly, we decided to proceed with teleconference meetings first as we prepared for video conference meetings. This involved a tremendous amount of work by staff of procedural services and digital services. Normally a project like this would take months, but of course we only had a few days to deliver. Our biggest challenge was the need to have a system that would allow for the functioning of such committees in the two official languages of Canada, as well as to have the proceedings either audio cast or webcast as per the order that was adopted by the House. On March 31st, the first House of Commons committee meeting held by teleconference took place. That was the first vir completely virtual committee meeting in Canadian parliamentary history. On April 3rd, our Board of Internal Economy, while technically not a parliamentary committee, also met by teleconference. 
On April 8th, while we were working on a video conference solution for committees, the speaker, in reply to a letter from the government house leader, indicated that a house administration would be able to provide a solution for a virtual house in four weeks time. On April 9th, the first House of Commons committee meeting was held by video conference. We did so using the Zoom platform linked into our existing publication and broadcasting system. On April 11th, the House was again recalled to examine COVID-19 related legislation. When it did, it also authorized four more committees to meet remotely by video or teleconference. One of these committees was our Procedure and House Affairs Committee, which was given an order of reference instructing it to study, quote, the ways in which members can fulfill their parliamentary duties while the House stands adjourned on account of public health concerns caused by the COVID-19 pandemic, end of quote. The order of reference also notes that during its study, the committee should consider the temporary modification of certain procedures, consider sittings in alternative locations, as well as technological solutions, including a virtual parliament to permit the House of Commons to continue to carry out its legislative functions. So the committee is meeting virtually on the issue of a virtual parliament and it is instructed to report back by May 15th. The committee has been hearing from various witnesses, including some international colleagues from Westminster, from Wales, and from Scotland. The committee was grateful for this testimony and shows how important it is that we consult each other to share information and best practices as we are doing right now with this webinar. On April 20th, the House met and adopted a motion establishing a special committee on the COVID-19 pandemic. The membership of this committee comprises all the members of the House of Commons, and the committee is authorized to consider ministerial statements, to allow members to table petitions, and to question ministers. The motion creating the special committee indicates that it shall meet in person on Wednesdays in the House chamber and virtually on Tuesdays and Thursdays. The first virtual meeting of the special committee was held on April 28th, where some 290 of our 338 members of parliament joined via Zoom. This had been preceded the day before by a dry run that was open to all MPs. Uh, maybe I'll just have the CPA staff put up the, uh, the deck yep. with the photos, thank you. Uh, so if we'll go to the next slide, uh, this is kind of, uh, there we are. This is a shot of the, uh, almost looks like a Houston NASA mission control room. This is our speaker at the left, some clerks, and the deputy speaker and some technical staff running the first uh, ever what's being called the the first virtual chamber but in fact it is a sitting of our special committee and linked into this were again 90 some percent of our members of parliament if we go to the next slide uh, we see a close-up of the uh, speaker presiding over activities again because it's a special committee and not the chamber per se both the speaker and ourselves as clerks were not obligated to to wear our our uniforms which was kind of fun uh, and although this was a very historic event and got a lot of media attention for the most part the media focused on the backgrounds of members uh, because of course with virtual sittings and the use of zoom and the like you have a sneak peek into people's uh, living rooms studies etc and and the the media found this this quite amusing i, I know some parliaments are, are obligating the use of neutral backgrounds virtual backgrounds uh, that's one thing the speaker has asked the procedure committee to consider whether there should be any rules in terms of what should or should not be permitted as uh, backgrounds. But by uh, all accounts, the most popular background was the background that the Minister of Industry used. And we'll just go to the next picture. And I'm sure you'll all agree with me, that's a pretty impressive background that he had when he was addressing the committee and responding to, to questions from the opposition. Uh, so the first in-person me in -person meeting of the special committee was held on April 29th. And that was immediately followed by yet another recall sitting to debate legislation related to student aid during COVID-19 and where yet another committee was added to the list of committees that can meet virtually. We can uh, take down the, uh, the PowerPoint, we won't need it anymore. Uh, we continue to improve what I just described while at the same time working on a solution to propose to the speaker by the end of this week with, with respect to a virtual parliament. And maybe just one minute then uh, on some of the challenges that we uh, faced. Uh, as previously mentioned, the issue of requiring simultaneous interpretation has been a significant one. Uh, 
Members have to mute and unmute themselves, but for those members that are bilingual and intervene in both languages, they also have to toggle between languages before speaking. Uh, Canada is a very large country with several time zones, so we had to take that into consideration. While normally we have committees starting as early as 8.45 in the morning, we can now only start at 11 in the morning, which is 8 in the morning on the west coast of Canada, and as a result, committees are sitting into the evening. Connectivity is another major consideration. Some regions of Canada have very poor internet service, and this is a challenge. Our IT folks have been reaching out to each and every member to test their devices, test their connectivity, and to share best practices, for example, the use of headsets. Resources are another issue. We and our partners, such as the Translation Bureau, have many staff unable to work full time as they're taking care of young children or elderly family members. Furthermore, it takes more staff to support a virtual committee as compared to an in-person committee. For example, it takes us about three committee clerks as opposed to the traditional one in order to support a virtual committee sitting. Given our resource constraints, we email the WIPs once per week as to our capacity and provide a template schedule that they then negotiate amongst themselves and complete, deciding which committees will sit and for how long. The nature of our proceedings is another factor. For instance, in our question period, we know who will be asking questions as we obtain lists from the parties in advance, but we have no idea, and the speaker has no idea, which minister will be rising to answer each question. Finally, in working on a solution for a virtual parliament, while inspired by the hybrid model being used in the UK and elsewhere, we don't have clear direction from the parties as to their preference for a given solution. This is because one of our parties the main opposition party, in fact, would much prefer limited in-person sittings of the House, with, of course, safety measures put in place that could perhaps be augmented by virtual participation of other members. They have been quite vocal with their concerns over having a virtual parliament. The other parties, including the governing party, although we're in a minority parliament situation, are much more open to virtual sittings, who so are anxiously awaiting to see what our procedure committee will recommend in terms of a solution that we could then proceed with. But we continue to work hard on a solution. We'll be testing a hybrid model with over 300 employees later this week. With that, I'd like to thank you again for your attention and look forward to your questions later on. Thank you very much, Eric, for that really interesting and informative presentation, uh, particularly the work of the, the committees uh, and some of the uh, challenges and solutions that your parliament uh, has encountered and, and tackled. Um, so for our third panellist, I'm really excited to welcome Patricia Almeida. Patricia is the coordinator of innovation and digital strategy in the Chamber of Deputies in Brazil. So we have a non-Commonwealth uh, perspective and insight here today, which is really exciting. I think as a global issue, um, I think it's important to hear from a broad range of voices and jurisdictions as possible, and particularly uh, coming from Brazil, who have been very, uh, again, proactive and forward thinking in terms of their responses. Um, not to mention a few examples in terms of enabling resolutions to enable um, parliamentarians and parliaments to work remotely and live casting um, remote sessions uh, via uh, social and public media. Uh, so without further ado, I'll pass over now to Patricia, who will give her presentation. Not sure if Patricia may have frozen. Um, sorry, we're having a few <laughs> technical uh, difficulties. I think in this case, while we wait for Patricia, um, we will actually hand over to Jonathan. Um, Jonathan is the deputy clerk of the Tinvold, uh, the Parliament of Isle of Man. And despite being a small legislature, it is in fact, and I think Jonathan, you may correct me, um, is the oldest uh, standing parliament um, in the world and again Parliament of Isle of Man were one of the first um, parliaments within the Commonwealth uh, to conduct fully virtual plenary sessions um, and obviously Jonathan has been Deputy Clerk has been central to these activities so without further ado I will hand over to you Jonathan uh, a bit earlier than anticipated but I'm sure you will manage. Thank you Jack <laughs> and I started the screen sharing is that working for you can you see my screen? 
We can, Jonathan, yes. Totally good. Okay. Um, I'll start uh, in the traditional way uh, by saying uh, thank you very much to the CPA for inviting uh, us and uh, for taking an interest in the Isle of Man. We, we, and it's a very great pleasure to be here with the other uh, distinguished panelists and to have the opportunity to share our experience of what has been an extraordinary time in, in every way. Uh, the focus for today, of course, is in the domain of services to our parliament. Um, so, as I say, we always start by telling people where the Isle of Man is. I'm sure many people in the seminar are aware of the Isle of Man, but just in case, uh, I will remind you that the Isle of Man sits in the middle of the Irish Sea, somewhere between England and Ireland, and it has a population of 83,000 people or thereabouts. Um, for our purposes, the key facts in this slide are that we have a, a small parliament with 35 members, and we have around about 20 staff to serve those members. Um, and there it is. That's uh, our parliament in, in uh, normal in, in normal times. Uh, as you can see there, we have a nice 19th century debating chamber, which I encourage you to come and visit. Uh, what are the key features of our parliament from the point of view of virtual sittings? Well, first and foremost, uh, like the United Kingdom, we are an ancient uh, kingdom and an ancient jurisdiction, so we don't have a single written constitutional document. Um, our, the powers of Tyndall are inherent powers. They haven't been given to Tyndall by anybody else, uh, by Westminster or anybody else. So these powers exist because they exist. And that becomes quite useful when you start trying to change procedures uh, because you don't have to consult lawyers because there's no written document to interpret. Well, nearly no, none. Uh, there's a small amount of primary legislation in the Isle of Man which talks about what should happen in our parliament. Um, including a recently updated Tyndall Proceedings Act of 1876, which as of uh, January this year now includes an express incorporation of Article 9 of the Bill of Rights. Again, quite handy to have that in our back pocket uh, in, in case any of these privileged issues should arise as, as we go through this interesting time. We also discovered uh, that we had an Emergency Powers Act from 1936 uh, nobody had really thought about this much apart from the Department of Home Affairs, um, but when the crisis arose we all rushed to read it and it's quite interesting the way it's, it's drafted because it enables uh, the government to issue a proclamation of emergency and once that's been done to, to regulate just about every aspect of life. Uh, but there's a catch, uh, they have to lay their regulations before Tim World within a week and Tyndall has the opportunity to say yes or no to the continuation of those regulations. So it's a really good system. It gets the right balance between the uh, need of the government to act quickly in an emergency, but then the need of the parliament to have a say over whether the government has gone far enough or, or indeed too far. Uh, in the present circumstances, uh, of course, the thing about meeting within a week to approve the regulations became very important. We couldn't just draw stumps, go home for Easter, and wait a month for our colleagues to build us a virtual chamber. We still had to keep sitting weekly at the very least uh, throughout the entire time. So that's what we did. Um, a couple of other factors of our normal situation which are relevant. Um, the members are very attached to their chambers, but they're not attached, they don't have the, the kind of um, attachment which I've encountered in some places. Uh, because we did do a full decant uh, as recently as 2003, so uh, although the chambers are important, they're not the only place that the Tinwald, that Tinwald sits, and indeed the, the, the hill behind me is where we also sit once a year. So there is a, a notion that Tinwald exists apart from the chamber, which, which again is quite important. Um, members are very attached to uh, their voting buttons. Uh, which we've had since we were refurbished in 2006, um, and we can talk about voting some more later in questions perhaps. Uh, ironically, well I, I, I won't say any more about voting just yet, but this is the way we vote normally uh, using these uh, these buttons in the in the chamber. Okay. Uh, by default all of our papers are distributed electronically as a, as a, uh, as a default. Uh, we occasionally print papers out for members but not normally. So this screenshot shows you the way in which they receive their papers for their normal sittings, 
and have done uh, for about the last 10 years. And we've had a slight tapering off over those 10 years. So 10 years ago, uh, members received papers in hard copy and could opt out. Uh, when we got to the uh, general election of 2016, it was the other way around. Uh, papers were electronic, uh, but they could opt in to pay to hard copy if they wanted to. And about the last opting in member retired just a few weeks before the pandemic hit. So all papers are electronic and, and clearly that's a big help when you come to a remote parliament. Uh, we don't have television, but we do have uh, radio broadcasts and we do our own live audio, live and listen again, audio streaming. As you can see there, we're doing that since 2016 uh, or thereabouts. So that's how we get our proceedings out to the public. Uh, clearly that's an important factor when you talk about the virtual arrangements. Um, Hansard was mentioned, and I haven't got a slide for this, but we do have a Hansard team, which uh, members of whom, which normally sit in our chamber recording and logging what's going on, but they're also used to working on uh, proceedings where they're not present because they provide Hansard services to other jurisdictions, notably Gibraltar and Guernsey. So quite familiar with the concept of supporting a chamber, which we're not able to enter. Um, we have some experience, uh, like uh, Eric said, in Canada, uh, of using um, using remote conference facilities uh, in our committees. This is an example from a couple of years ago, where we had evidence uh, from representatives of the British Broadcasting Corporation. They actually spent all day trying to get from London to the Isle of Man, got as far as a hotel in Manchester Airport and gave up and uh, gave evidence from there over Skype on that occasion. So we had a little bit of experience of that when this crisis hit us. So uh, what did we do when the crisis arrived? Well, the um, pro 16th of March was the big day in the Isle of Man. That was the day that we had a proclamation of emergency. And uh, for the next couple of weeks, uh, we sat like this, which is a social distancing arrangement in our own chamber. You recognize the chamber from the earlier picture, but now the members have spread out and you can see uh, at the far end of the room, at the top of the picture, members sitting in the public gallery. This is just enabled so that we could use the whole space of the chamber. And we did this, as I say, for a couple of weeks, uh, but members didn't really like it. So we then moved to our virtual chamber, which we've been operating since the 3rd of April. Um, the, the virtual chamber is uh, operated with just four people, or, well, five people in the building. So you can see there the president of Tinwald on the big, in the big chair in the middle, in the wig, and on his uh, right, left of the picture, the Speaker of the House of Keys. And then you can see my colleague Roger and me doing pretty much everything that need, is needed in the building to make the virtual sitting happen. There is a fifth person, and that is, of course, the person who took the photograph. Uh, we adopted from our friends in the Channel Islands the idea of a roll call at the start of the sitting. We do this before we go public, but we do that in order to make sure that everybody is present and that everybody's audio is working. That's uh, going on at the moment, actually. It hasn't been going particularly well today, but it's up to today, it's been working very well. Uh, the question was raised uh, in, in, uh, in Liam's, or at least the issue was, was raised in Liam's presentation. You know, what do you do if a member cannot connect? and uh, touch wood at the moment, members have been able to connect. There have been a few, ish, uh, a couple of members uh, coming in late uh, here and there, but they've all managed to get through uh, eventually, which has been a relief. Um, how do members indicate a desire to speak? Well, with this uh, virtual chamber is based on Microsoft Teams. Uh, that's the Teams console where I sit if I'm doing this uh, chamber and uh, they have to write in the chat box. Uh, that's the chat box when it's working properly. Uh, they just write the word speak and then the president either sees that in the chat box or if he doesn't see it, one of us passes him a note saying, Miss Costain would like to speak and he calls her to speak. So that works uh, pretty well. Uh, how does the audio get out to the world? Well, this uh, image shows you the, the heart of the virtual uh, the virtual tin world. So if I, sorry, if I just go back to this slide, uh, as you can see there, there's a console there. It's not particularly elegant, but it works. The audio comes into the Teams console. It, it goes down those wires to those speakers uh, there. 
and then it is picked up by that rather swan-like microphone which is connected to our normal audio setup and goes out to the world and indeed goes to our Hansard colleagues for transcribing. How do we do voting? Well, here's a, here's a vote and uh, what happens is that the president says, I'm now putting the question, it is assumed you're content, if not, uh, please, if you wish to indicate dissent, please do so now. And at the top of the screen, you can see a member there uh, indicating dissent. The president then says, okay, it's time for a vote. And the clerk writes, vote. And all the members write yes or no. And then we have to count up how many said yes and how many said no. That is done in a very traditional way. And it works. So this is our virtual chamber. Um, where are we going next? I'm conscious of the time. So I will just mention that, um, of course, the, the biggest problem, well, sorry, uh, we got into this very, very quickly. We will get out of it rather more slowly, I think. Um, we are doing our best, having set these arrangements in place within about a week, uh, earlier in, in, in halfway through March, to try and make them better as we go. And uh, I was just, as, as others were speaking earlier, getting messages from the chamber to say that the new laptop that we just put in to support this process uh, has had some teething problems. That's normal, but uh, we're going to proceed like this until somebody tells us that we can go back into the chamber properly. And our final picture is this. This is what we're not going to be doing this year. Uh, another aspect of our job is to try and work out what on earth to do about Tyndall Day. We've been doing this for at least 600 years and uh, we're going to do something on the 5th of July, but we don't know what. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much, Jack. Thank you very much, Jonathan, for that really uh, fascinating and interesting presentation. Again, to see another legislature's um, innovative and um, sort of forward thinking uh, responses to the pandemic. So I think we do have Patricia now connected. Um, so I will pass over now to Patricia. Uh, we've already done the introduction, so um, I'll leave it to you, Patricia. Thank you. Thanks, Jack. On behalf of the Brazilian House of Representatives, I thank you very much the CPA for this opportunity. And I would like to, to ask you, to invite you to watch a short video about our experience in virtual, virtual sessions. Maybe? Jack? Mesmo durante a atual crise de saúde pública, a Câmara dos Deputados continua seu trabalho através do plenário virtual, uma forma de seguir representando os direitos da população em tempos de isolamento social. Através do Infoleg, o mesmo aplicativo que permite a você, cidadão, acompanhar os projetos discutidos na casa, agora os deputados também podem participar de debates e realizar votações diretamente dos seus tablets, celulares e computadores. Para tornar isso possível, foi criado um sistema de deliberação remota. Com ele, o deputado marca sua presença, entra no debate, se informa sobre a orientação do líder da bancada e contribui com seu voto sobre os projetos analisados na sessão. Trata-se de um sistema inovador. É o único que permite ao presidente da casa gerenciar a sessão diretamente do seu console na mesa diretora, enquanto os outros membros da casa podem participar tanto presencial quanto virtualmente. O sistema foi desenvolvido exclusivamente pela equipe de tecnologia e da área legislativa da Câmara dos Deputados. Com o plenário virtual, ficam garantidas votações importantes para o enfrentamento da crise, como auxílio emergencial para trabalhadores informais e as alterações orçamentárias necessárias para o combate à Covid-19. Esse sistema vai funcionar enquanto durar o período de isolamento social. Assim como todas as sessões no plenário, as sessões do plenário virtual são exibidas ao vivo pelos meios de comunicação da Câmara dos Deputados, e as informações sobre os projetos e decisões tomadas podem ser acessados através do nosso portal na internet, mantendo assim o compromisso democrático e de transparência da instituição com o povo brasileiro. Thanks, Jack. Now I'm going to...
to share here. Just a moment, please. Thanks. Um, well, as most of the legislative house, the Brazilian House of Representatives had to put on practice a few actions to ensure the continuity of the legislative process, despite the COVID-19 scenario. Uh, consider that uh, those actions should be supported by a law. Our MPs approved a resolution which established that all the 513 MPs should be able to work on a remote work and those virtual sessions should be prepared to, to deliberate. It means that we had to uh, consider at least an attendance registry and any voting functionality in our IT solution. And all the MPs should be able to do everything that has to be done in a, in a session uh, with only an internet link and a smartphone. Consider those issues. We, um, we designed our virtual planner architecture with the three components, a video conference service, an app, the InfoLag, and a set of legislative systems. The video conference is used only to transfer um, uh, public images and sound, and we know that everything in the plenary must be public. So we disabled all other functionalities like chat, file transfer, and the app. The app, the InfoLag was launched in 2016 uh, in order to make the, the citizens be aware about important information from the legislative process. On the proposal of the virtual panel, we just had to add new functionalities to be available only to the MPs. The app, the app interacts with the internal legislative system through an, an encrypted channel. And it's important to highlight that this uh, communication is absolutely separated from the video conference platform. And the result of everything is, is published in our website as well as open data. Regarding the InfoLag, one can see a lot of information like everything that happens in plenary sessions, everything that happens in committee meetings, but also the bills, the proposals, not only the full text and amendments, but also all the decisions related to them. Before voting, the MPs uh, can uh, see the caucus leaders voting orientation and here we can see a vote resulting panel too by the app. But instead, uh, despite all steps necessary to a virtual plenary session were encompassed by the app, we realized that we need to offer a bit more to the MPs. They needed at least a way to submit a new bill, a new proposal outside the house. And that's what we did. Uh, now, uh, each MP can submit a new bill uh, from everywhere. Uh, it, it receives a digital authentication. It also occurs in case of multiple authors. In case of amendments, it, it also happens, the authentication. And the flow goes to the video plenary session to be voted. And everything that happens in the in this, uh, video conference is transmitted through our TV and YouTube channel, as well as through our website. And regarding our video conference infrastructure, we consider that the sessions uh, would be held on the real plenary, mixing cameras and microphones inside the plenary with those from the microphone and the computers from the MPs. Uh, as a consequence, we could operate on a hybrid mode. Uh, then uh, having MPs inside and outside the plenary at any, any distribution. Um, from from uh, the IT, our intention is to offer to the house a way to operate 
uh, after the crisis in situations like health problems with MPs or transport problems or emergency meetings or other situations like that we are today, a crisis. Well, yesterday um, we had our 20th virtual session, the, the session number 20. And when you look for the drivers that made us uh, reach our target in eight days, there were eight days between the resolution and the first virtual meeting. We find the answer in our strategic planning that we built four years ago. There, we find the uh, um, uh, decisions like, firstly, the decision to build a legislative process app. Secondly, the decision to develop a system to permit MPs to submit bills digitally. This system was ready, but hadn't been uh, used yet. It was launched during the crisis. Thirdly, the decision to adopt agile methodologies. So today, everyone in, um, in the IT directorate is used to prototype um, systems to be delivered in short time frames. And our last decision was last year to run a digital legislative process project. We know that we are very far from the end of the project, but the fact of having it started last year, when we had a lot of uh, discussions about this issue, clarified the perception about what could be reused and what should be built from zero. So to summarize, uh, we do believe that those strategic uh, decisions um, saved a time that we didn't have this year. <clears throat> we didn't have during the crisis, we didn't have time to think. So uh, they made the difference. That's all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Patricia, for that really, again, really interesting presentation on some of the innovative work that the Chamber of Deputies is doing in Brazil. It's really interesting to see. And as well, that non-Commonwealth uh, perspective as well is, is great, for a, particularly for a CPA event. So uh, thank you for that. Um, so now we're going to go to the Q&A. Before we do so, we're going, we have a few more polls to ask the attendees. This is specifically for the attendees um, as a bit of interaction. We have some um, questions related to the topics uh, that we're addressing today. Uh, so my colleagues now are going to put those up while I introduce the Q&A session. Here we go. Yes, yeah, so this is the first one. So if you don't mind just taking a very few uh, seconds just to, to answer some of these. Um, and then I will go swiftly on to the Q&A because I'm conscious of time. Um, for the Q&A session, we will use the hand raising function predominantly. So if you do have a question, uh, please uh, raise your virtual hand uh, within the function on Zoom and we will try to get to you. Um, like I said earlier, we will um, take in rounds of three. So we will take three questions at a time and then allow panelists to answer. And hopefully by the end of the session, we will have got through as many people as possible. And please, uh, to those asking questions, please just keep your questions as short as possible. Uh, if you do want to make additional comments or share your experiences, please save that for the chat function or in any follow up uh, with panelists or the CPA after the session. So we did have some pre submitted questions in the registration process, so I will give priority to a few of those first. Um, if panelists did want to ask a question, uh, attendees did want to ask a question, please raise your hand. Um, I know we had some um, initial ones um, submitted uh, via email, um, but I have a few hands coming up now. So I will invite uh, Shanette Wolf of Bermuda uh, to ask her question.
Hello, Shinette. If you'd like to unmute your mic and you can ask your question. There we go. Hi, Shinette. Hi, how are you? Um, Very well, Jeff? thanks. I'm good, thank you. My question is regarding the presiding officers. Is it compulsory that all presiding officers have to be in the chamber when the virtual sittings take place? We, us in Bermuda, what we did, we've had a virtual sitting and our speaker has been using the WebEx platform from his office. But what I was concerned about was the importance of having the mace um, available during the virtual cities. That was one question. And I also um, submitted another question yesterday and I don't remember what it was. But that was it for now. Shinette, if I remember correctly, it was in regards to conducting virtual committee meetings. Uh, yes. And I think that may have been addressed by, by particularly Eric, but he may wish to expand on that. No, I'm fine with that. I, I enjoyed um, Eric's presentation. Hi, Eric. Hi, Eric. We can hear you. Would you like to respond? Uh, oh, sh shall I go first? Sure. Okay. Yeah. Hello, uh, Shernet. Thank you for your, your question. Uh, as we've set up a special committee and not a virtual chamber per se, or not yet anyway, um, we uh, have, as I showed in, in the photo, our speaker and clerks working out of one of our uh, well-equipped committee rooms. Uh, so that's also, as I mentioned, why he's not wearing his uniform. And when uh, the special committee meets in person in the chamber, again, because technically it's a committee, although a committee consisting of all the members of the house, uh, it's a committee that just happens to be meeting in our chamber. Again, uh, we don't uh, have the mace present. And while the speaker is there, uh, he is not in uniform, nor are we the table officers. Uh, so that's what we've been doing so far. Uh, this week, the speaker has indicated an intention that he would like to start chairing on our Thursday virtual meetings of the special committee to do so from his home. Uh, so uh, that will be yet another challenge for us to see how that will work because we won't physically be in the same room to provide advice, uh, et cetera, uh, immediately to, to the speaker. So I think that would be it for myself. I'd turn over to the other panelists who might have other information or answers to provide. I mean, I could add from the UK House of Commons that our speaker is very keen to appear in person in the chamber. And as you saw in the video, we have the mace in the chamber, um, but the House of Lords has been meeting entirely virtually, um, which, has led to a kind of question I don't work for the House of Lords it's hard for me to answer there is a, a question mark there's some reservations they have about how far they can go down the track of taking legislative decisions in a virtual chamber um, but they're sort of negotiating their way step by step through those um, Jack, in the Isle of Man, we have uh, kept the sword of state in the chamber, as you might have seen in the photograph. But our advice to the presiding officer and to anybody else is that this is entirely voluntary. It's a nice to have, but it has no legal or constitutional effect. And if the sword of state was not there, the lawmaking would still be uh, just as effective. Thank you. Thank you, Jeanette. Thank you for those uh, questions and hopefully uh, the panel um, answered them sufficiently. <laughs> so we do have um, a few more hands raised. Um, so maybe I will do them one at a time. Uh, so we have yeah, Aggie Mumby who will now ask a question. Hi Aggie. Hi, thank you. Hi, and thank you very much for, uh, for the presentation we are following. Uh, I wanted to find out from the panelists, um, how much time do they allocate to the virtual meetings and uh, do they consider the, the internet connection interruptions and then probably extend the, the virtual meeting times? Thank you. So if Patricia, would you, would you like to, to begin um, answering that one? I know we didn't come to you on the last um, uh, round. Yes. 
as I said, uh, we had a lot of uh, parts of our solution almost ready. So we had just eight days to put everything. But uh, in our first uh, virtual meeting, we, we have only the video conference without the app. Only two days after the app was done and uh, was available in the virtual uh, stores. But uh, regarding the meetings, they are very, very long meetings. The attendance has been very uh, high. So, uh, and um, I you mean, I think uh, the, the lowest attendance that we had was 500 MPs. Okay, so from our side, eight days to put everything and um, long meetings, long meetings. Thank Did you, Patricia. Yeah. I will open up to um, Jonathan or Liam or Eric, if you would like to. Uh... I can answer from the Isle of Man very quickly. Uh, the question doesn't apply with us because we don't allocate time in any deliberate fashion. Uh, Liam or Eric, if you had any remarks, I'm not sure if you wanted to add anything. I'm not sure I've grasped the question. We are sitting now for three days a week instead of our normal four. And on those three days, we are typically sitting for three two hour sessions with a half hour break between them really a sort of technical break just to make sure that our staff have contacted all of the uh, MPs who are waiting on online. So we are condensing I think our proceedings. We have questions and ministerial statements. We've had second readings of bills this week. We've done approval of delegated legislation. So we are progressively moving into more complex areas of legislative work um, for which we will need a secure voting solution which is being tested as we speak but we it hasn't actually been approved by our procedure committee as far as i know just yet maybe just very quickly in a similar vein uh, we have uh, normally 24 uh, standing committees but only seven have been uh, authorized to sit virtually and normally our house would sit Monday to, to Friday for what, seven, eight hours per, per day. And that's all been condensed into just a, a few hours. So no, certainly much less time uh, being spent on virtual meetings than normally would be the case. Uh, but in large part, again, as I mentioned in my presentation, it, it's due to our resource capacity uh, restrictions. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. And thank you, Aggie, for, for the question. All right, thank you. Um, so I think some of our attendees are a little camera shy. Uh, we haven't got as many hands up as we anticipated, but we, we did receive quite a few uh, written submissions. So I will pose some on behalf of attendees. Um, I think one of the um, recurring question and an issue for, for many um, is in terms of managing standing orders um, and how the what are the implications for maybe adjusting standing orders to accommodate uh, either virtual or, or hybrid sittings. Um, so I will go um, to the, maybe Liam or Eric if they want to to initiate. Liam, why don't you go first? Sorry, I was just typing an answer to a question. To initiate a discussion of which? Um, so it, it, the question was in terms of uh, managing or adjusting standing orders to accommodate for um, virtual or, or hybrid sittings. Uh, yes, the first thing we did was to pass a standing order allowing our select committees, our scrutiny inquiry committees to meet virtually. Um, they've done that very successfully, but because it's so time consuming in technical resource, there are only four meetings a day. That's a maximum of 20 a week. They've had to become better at sharing their time. They can't all meet at the same time. 
Uh, the next thing we did was to make provision for um, virtual participation by members in the chamber for oral questions to ministers, urgent questions and ministerial statements. That has meant setting deadlines a long way in advance so that we know precisely when each piece of business is going to come up and we draw up quite heavily scripted lists of who is going to speak and precisely when. So a lot um, of the proceedings are now quite um, to a formula, working your way down a list, everybody has their five minutes to speak or their one minute to ask a question, what, whatever it is, scripted out in advance. That helps the technicians contact everybody in advance to make sure uh, their connection is sound. Um, we then added a provision to take substantive proceedings in the House. Initially, we only took ones where votes weren't required. So in the video recording, you'll have seen the bill was read a second time, but that was by agreement um, for the formality. The speaker took the voices in the chamber, but there was agreement that no vote was required on that bill. Uh, the same for two other bills that week and for all of the regulations and orders were passing this week. Um, as we go ahead, we, we will have to add in uh, a provision for contested votes. Um, so we have made a number of temporary standing orders which give a lot of discretion to the speaker. Um, there's one very striking provision that says the speaker may amend how these orders are implemented provided he has the agreement of the leader of the house, that is to say the government minister for parliamentary affairs. Every day substantive business begins with a motion which the speaker simply declares is agreed to. That seems strange. There's no possibility of uh, discussion or dissent, but he can only declare it agreed to if the motion organizing the time for the day's proceedings has been signed up to by the three major parties, so the government and the two main opposition parties. So he's got already the concurrence of 85 to 90% of the House. Um, so we have had some changes to procedure to, to make it work, um, but in general, they've not been controversial. I think what is most controversial is the electronic voting, um, which a sizable number of members do not want to see become part of a permanent solution. Thank you, maybe, maybe just from the uh, Canadian perspective, our speaker and uh, certain officials, including myself, appeared before our procedure committee uh, yesterday uh, with respect to their study on a virtual parliament. And it was one question that was raised on several occasions as to how many of the standing orders would have to be amended, changed, or new ones added if we were to move to a virtual parliament. Uh, one suggestion that came up would be to have a whole parallel set of standing orders uh, that could be, I guess, what uh, initiated if there were to be another crisis like the pandemic we're currently facing. Uh, at some point, perhaps uh, through a vote in the House or by decision of the Speaker after consultation with the House leaders, there'd be some kind of mechanism to trigger, if you will, a separate set of emergency uh, standing orders. Uh, otherwise, as Liam just suggested, uh, there's already a provision in our standing orders for the Speaker to have a certain amount of discretion in uh, implementing or adjusting certain standing orders. We have one, for instance, to vote. A member has to rise in his or her seat. Obviously, we've had in the past wheel chair bound uh, members and the speaker has the discretion to to ignore that standing order requirement for any wheelchair bound uh, member so you could again if there was uh, agreement see uh, the speaker adjust current rules without necessarily having them uh, completely modified to take into consideration new procedures that uh, the house would like to put in place for for situations like this thank you I don't know if uh, Jonathan or, or Patricia had any um, additional remarks before Is we move. The question about standing orders, Jack. Yes. Um, in the Isle of Man, and when we sit virtually, each sitting begins with the uh, a motion which is moved by the Speaker uh, that standing orders be, ex be suspended to the extent necessary to conduct this sitting virtually. 
and that is amendable and votable on and has always gone through on the nod. But I think it is quite a good mechanism because I think in time to come, uh, it may be that people will start to use that as a chance to talk about whether it's time to go back into physical settings. Thank you, Jonathan. I don't know if Patricia, you had any additional remarks or we can. I think it's a question more directly to the clerks, but from the yes. IT, <laughs> from the IT, what I saw, I thought the first meetings with a lot of agreement before. And uh, we had a 20. So the first five, six, I see a lot of agreement before. And uh, regarding the order, the questions, the, the, uh, we have a, a system from which the MPs can, uh, can the, put the intention to talk. And there is a list being building during the, the session. Okay, but we realized that a few of them wanted to be more highlighted. Okay, and um, because of this, we have to to um, to build an extra uh, panel to show the leaders fix it in each frame. Okay, this was a. Uh, 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 a thing that was uh, uh, asked for us from the president. That's why we we made. Thank you, Patricia. So we have we do have a few more hands up now of some more questions. So I'll invite Paul Martinez and John Davis in um, to propose their questions. Paul, you go first, and then John, you can you can ask uh, after Paul. Hi, Paul. Hi. Can you hear me? We can, yes. Hi, um, just a very quick question. It's talking about security because obviously we're looking here at using either Teams or Zoom. And um, our IT staff are going more towards using Teams because they, they're saying that Zoom is very much liable to hacking, whereas we can use Teams, uh, which is an encrypted channel. Um, what, you know, can I have any views from other members? I know that the Isle of Man is using um, Teams and uh, UK is using Zoom. But what about the other 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 members who are listening on this webinar? Um, have they been, uh, you know, uh, been talking to the IT guys as to which is the most ideal system to use for this? Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Uh, and then we'll ask in fact John if you want to um, ask your question. There we go, John. Hi, John. Hi, Jack, and thank you all. Uh, John Davis from CPA UK. Just to ask any and all really whether you have a sense yet of uh, which of any of these innovations you think are most likely or should be most likely to uh, be kept by your uh, legislatures after this period. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, so I'll go to Patricia first if she wants to um, answer Paul's um, and then maybe Eric after Patricia. Thank you. Thank you for the questions. Regarding the video conference platform, we studied a lot about it. We discussed it a lot about it with many uh, partners, many um, other parliaments that are with us in the discussion. And regarding them, um, everybody was afraid with Zoom notes about security problems. So we studied each one of the problems, the, the security problems, and uh, uh, we built a, a risk assessment report that is updated every week and is shared with the parliaments that are talking with us. And our conclusion is for public images and sound, we, uh, we don't have problems with Zoom. Everything, we had found a solution to it. And it's very easy. And it was uh, uh, so easy that we bought in one day and we configured it, we, we set it in three days, okay, three days after. It's also a, a, a solution that we could put more than 500 MPs without problems with the performance, with uh, 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 images, okay. Team, 
Team is a good, is a very good um, collaborative um, platform. But I didn't see yet a good experience, a, a, a big experience with many parliaments, with many NEPs as we have in teams. I would like to see maybe uh, 100, it's okay, but in our case, we had 500. <laughs> so we needed something uh, um, very, uh, with a good performance, okay? But those that use Team, they like. Um, but we also studied WebEx, Cisco WebEx. Uh, some parliaments have studied uh, Kudo or uh, Interaction. Those that use, uh, that need uh, uh, translation during the sections. So uh, uh, both of them, or all of them are, can be used. It depends on the case. But comparing teams with Zoom, I think the most difference is the, the number of MPs that you have. Thank you, Patricia. And if Eric, you want to um, answer, sure. you can yeah. answer both questions. Yeah. Very similar answer to Patricia, who I think summed it up very, very well. Uh, our IT security people did a lot of testing as well in consultation with some of our national security agencies. Uh, Zoom, uh, logic for the same reasons Patricia outlined, was selected, but again, taking into consideration that uh, sittings of committees uh, have been public. Uh, there is the issue of whether a committee wants to sit in camera and we had that very situation with a board of internal economy uh, meeting that we had last week, which was in camera. In that case, they had to move to Skype for business, but it was quite complicated. Again, we have the necessity for uh, interpretation for the two languages, and that was complicated to do uh, with Skype for business. Members had to use uh, two devices going into the meeting, uh, but there's still ongoing testing by our IT folks to, to see how these uh, different uh, technologies could, could be adapted to, to our needs. But so far, uh, for, again, for the same reasons that Patricia just outlined, uh, we've uh, gone with Zoom. Jonathan or Liam, uh, if you wanted to uh, answer both questions posed by Paul and, and John, uh, you're welcome to. Um, I think on what will be kept from the innovations, I think rather like Eric was saying in Canada, they already use um, virtual technology for witnesses in committee hearings. I think that is likely to become uh, much more prevalent now that members are used to using uh, video conferencing and it would help us increase our diversity, not least our geographical spread of witnesses at the moment. Um, proceedings tend to be rather um, London centric. Um, and on the security, yes, uh, Zoom is preferred by our broadcasters. Um, it's not, uh, it's fair to say, the favourite for the people who worry about security. So, with our committees, they're being advised to have their public sessions on Zoom and then to go to Teams for their in camera discussions. Um, I've already mentioned, I think, in my talk or in the chat box that in the Isle of Man, uh, we use Teams uh, for the virtual sittings, but we use Zoom for most of our committee work and anything that's internal within the parliamentary office. Um, and the reason we use Teams is, is the same reason as was mentioned, i.e. that uh, people tell us that it is more secure. Um, what will we keep, I think, uh, as with what Liam has just said, the notion of using video conferencing to take evidence from people who are not able to get here easily is something which we have used before, but it has been uh, occasional and I think it will become much more routine after this because we're also much more used to it. And I suppose another point which I might mention is that um, in our collaboration with our counterparts, especially our friends in the Channel Islands, it's become suddenly much, much more easy to get together and chat with them. And that's a really big uh, benefit of, of this technology. Uh, thank you, panellists, and thank you, John um, and Paul, uh, for your really informative questions. Thank you. Um, so we did have a few more hands up, which have now gone down. Okay, we have Simon Ross, um, who we will invite uh, to pose a question. 
Hi, Simon. Hi, can you hear me? We can hear you, yes. Excellent. Um, uh, well, I suppose, uh, uh, can I just say how interesting I found this, uh, some, uh, this webinar and also to emphasize what uh, uh, Jonathan King, the Art of Man, has said, how useful we found it uh, cooperating with our Crown Dependency colleagues when we had to set this up in a rush. Uh, can I also say how, uh, how interested I am to know how the approach, even of a very small assembly like our own, how similar it's been to some much larger assemblies. Uh, but th th just a sort of couple of minor points that arose um, from our last uh, session, last time I'd like to know if any colleagues have got views on. Um, we have uh, our voting, which is done by roll call, which has adapted quite well to a virtual sitting, uh, what they're calling Canada and indeed what we call an appel nominal is a, uh, is something we've been continuing with. Um, but uh, on occasions, the technology fails. And I, I think uh, the speaker gave a ruling uh, last week that when a member's technology failed, the, the vote, we were able to take the vote again in order to take account of his vote. And I'd be very interested to know uh, uh, if uh, colleagues who have that voting system have encountered something similar. The, the second and unrelated question uh, I had was, um, We've actually abandoned a lot of rules that required members to sort of physically do something. So um, uh, a give way uh, had to be raised by a member standing. So we, we've simply abandoned that because it's not practical in a virtual parliament. Um, yes, those are my two points. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. I will leave that to Jonathan to open. Okay. Uh, well, uh, the first point, what happens if a member's tech fails uh, during, and, they, and they miss a, uh, during a vote? Um, it, ha it nearly arose uh, because they vote in the, in the chat box. Uh, and what we've said is that we'll give them, we'll make as much effort as we can to record their vote. Um, but uh, it hasn't been an issue yet, is all I can say. Uh, and it could be an issue because, of course, when you say uh, if anyone wishes to register to sense, please do so now. If that is the very moment when their, their link to their house goes down, there's absolutely nothing we can do. And um, what we've said to members is, if you think you're going to want to register to sense, it would be a good idea to mention it in your speech, because of course in our parliament, everyone has the right to speak on every motion. So I think we, we hope that by those, by, 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 by those two means, number one, give them every possible chance to uh, tell us that they're going to call for a division by saying so when they have the right to speak and secondly at the moment of the division uh, to if, if they've got a problem they, they well i mean they just have to do their best to stay connected and part of it is part of it is on them unfortunately but we can only do what we can do uh, your second point standing up in order to uh, intervene in the debate um, we have uh, dealt with this using the chat box so we are quite strict with our members. They're not allowed to use the chat box for chat. And they find it very funny when I write that in the chat box, but that is actually a serious rule. Uh, they can write the word speak if they want to speak. They can write the word dissent if they want to dissent. And they can write the word intervene if they want to intervene. And then the presiding officer will spot that and will invite the member who's speaking. Uh, we'll ask them if they'll accept the intervention. Uh, thank you, Jonathan. Um, Eric? Uh, sure. In terms of the technology, it's actually a question uh, that's been raised on numerous occasions during the our procedure committee study on the notion of a virtual parliament. Uh, specifically, would it be a breach of a member's privileges if he or she's internet connection failed and the person could not or could not continue to participate? And so far, most of the witnesses have said, well, it'd be a little bit like there being a big snowstorm and a member not physically be able to make it to the House of Commons or miss the flight for reasons outside of their control would have to look at each case individually. Uh, but that in most cases, probably the speaker would say, well, really that there wasn't a impediment, there wasn't an, an obstruction of the, of the members' uh, rights per se. It just was almost as if it was a, a, a natural circumstance that impeded the member to connect. Um, Stand-up rule, we have uh, something similar or 
many similar things in our standing orders. And for instance, to force a recorded division, it requires five members to stand to force a recorded division. So things like that would have to be uh, either re rewritten in terms of some kind of emergency standing orders, or again, as mentioned earlier, give the authority to the speaker to, to adjust uh, those requirements. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. And Patricia, if you would like any remarks to make. Yes, thank you. A very good question. <laughs> um, we had to create uh, a new desk, uh, a new uh, service desk uh, exclusively to the, the virtual sessions. The people were prepared to those uh, systems and we had a lot of demands for it in the first days, a lot of them. Most of them were problems with um, um, password that had been lost or, uh, or um, how to do something, uh, doubts. In general, they were doubts. But we had um, a few problems with the connection, the link with the MP, uh, to the meeting during the meeting during the, the the time frame to voting and for this those situations the president authorized that the MP could declare orally the vote okay by a phone thank and you Patricia else? <laughs> yeah uh, I, I would like to add that there are a few WhatsApp groups um, among the MPs, another WhatsApp group among the, the person that uh, work with them. So when something is wrong, something is with, uh, in problem, they write and immediately someone <laughs> find a solution to them. What's up? Thank you, Patricia. And I don't know if Liam wanted to conclude this final um, um, question before we uh, wrap the session up. Sorry, Jack. Sorry. I was going to hand over, sorry, I was going to hand over to Liam if he wanted to um, add any final remarks before we conclude the session. Um, just to say how important I think it is that we sort of learn from each other um, as we've been going on and I've got some really good sort of written questions that I've been uh, trying to put answers to while, while, while we speak. I think it's been a really worthwhile um, occasion and I look forward to the, as it were, second half of our double header webinar tomorrow. Thank you, Liam. Um, and I think that... Um segues us nicely to the conclusion of the session. I will just remind, as we have run out of time, I'm conscious attendees and panellists um, have very busy schedules. So um, we do have a couple more remaining questions in the Q&A function. So if panellists did want to take a few minutes to maybe wrap up some written answers to some of the questions uh, that attendees have posed. Um, we will now conclude the session and I will conclude it by saying a huge thank you to all those in attendance, we had a really good turnout. Um, we had some really good questions. And, um, um, we tried to make it as interactive as possible in this setting. Um, but most importantly, thank you to our, our brilliant panelists who not only have taken their uh, time out of their schedule to talk to us today, but also uh, provide us with some really, really good, um, interesting and fascinating um, experiences and insights um, into their work. Uh, so I extend a warm thank you to you all um, and to my colleagues as well at the CPA and Jarvis um, for his opening remarks. Uh, we will just conclude before you all jump off, we will conclude with a final post assessment poll, um, which will pop up on your screen. And if again, if you just take a few seconds just to fill us out, this would really, uh, really be much appreciated for our own uh, monitoring and evaluation. purposes. Um, I'm sure this will be the first really informative for us. As you're answering that, I will um, end by saying that there will be a follow-up email for all
all the attendees by the CPA, which includes links to resources that have not been referenced here, but related to the subject matter. It includes the CPA toolkit that was recently released um, and any additional documents that come from the respective legislatures of our panelists. Uh, share their email addresses with attendees. So if there were any additional um, comments or further queries you had, uh, please feel free. Uh, to contact them. This will all be within the motion. I realise I may have been breaking up there. My connection may have um, gone unstable. So it's now coming into the poll. So I will end the session now. Again, thank you all for turning up. Panellists, thank you very much. Um, and hopefully we sh shall see you all again in better circumstances. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. Thanks, Jack. That's great. Thank you very much. Have a good day, everybody. Okay. And you. See you.